Last week, um, we titled the message, The Gospel is About a Person. And we want to go further. Well, the week before that, it was The Gospel is About Promise. And so we went a week later and said, let's go further than just saying the gospel is about promise, because it is. It's not the gospel of works. It's a gospel of faith, the covenant of promise, Ephesians chapter 2 says. And um, so then when the next week we said, well, let's, let's go further than just promise. Let's see that this is about a person who makes promises. So it's the promiser that we're looking at last week. This week we want to go even further and say the gospel is about partaking of the person who is the promiser. And all this is based in 2 Corinth or 2 Peter chapter 1 if you got your bibles you may want to turn there. And last week we showed out of Galatians, Romans and Hebrews that we are not to live by the law and in fact Galatians says faith is not of law. So God takes the law in Christ, fulfills it, removes it, nailing it to the cross, and he puts his son in us. So what we have to see is that we're not living by a law, we're living in a person. So I don't have an exterior, exterior law to abide by, but I have a person that I abide in. It's a big difference between the two. And so in the garden it starts off, and everybody's familiar with this, Garden of Eden, God doesn't give Adam and Eve something to do, something to try. Christians today, when they get saved, and even, even after they get saved, they're trying to obey the law. And this is not something we try to do. It's already been done. Christ fulfilled it. He lives within us. And what we have to see is it's not an exterior law that I'm trying to, trying to do, but I am resting in the person inside of me that's already done it. And when I rest in him, he lives his life through me. And so in the garden, God does not give them something to do. Commandments. There's a perfect start. Give them ten commandments. No, he gives them a tree to eat from. So God's not asking them to try something. God's not asking them to do something. He's asking them to partake of something. And the tree of knowledge of good and evil is a tree that tells you what to do. Do good, avoid evil. But the tree of life you partake of. So when you eat, you partake. And that's abiding. That's John 14, 15, 16. That's what the, those three chapters, the theme is. Now, so faith is not of law. So you can't be acting in faith, saying you have faith, and at the same time go out there and try to do the law. Galatians is clear on that. Faith is not of law. We've talked about that, so we're not going to go any further there. But Jesus had a great opportunity when the Pharisees came up to him and said, what must we do to do the works of him, of, the, of God? He doesn't give them a list. Well, you know, forgive, tithe, fast, pray, all the religious works that people do today. What he tells them to do is he says, believe. Believe, in other words, have faith. So there's a perfect example that Jesus could have gave them something to do and yet doesn't, instead gives them the only way to live by and that's what Habakkuk says, Romans says, Galatians says, Hebrews says, the just shall live by faith. Not by commandments, not by works, but by faith. And this is why Jesus said, now remember, this is about partaking. Faith is partaking of the person of Jesus. As Adam and Eve partook of the tree of life, we are partaking of the life of Christ that's within us. This is why Jesus said, if you can't eat my flesh and drink my blood, you can't have no part of me. Now this made a lot of his disciples in John chapter 6, verse 66 mad when he said that, if you don't eat my flesh, drink my blood. They're thinking cannibalism, but he's like, no, you're missing the whole point. I'm simply saying that the new covenant is my life is going to be inside of you, and the only way you're going to be able to live it is partake of my nature that you're one with and let me live my life through you. 
And that's eating his flesh and drinking his blood. They, they, they couldn't see beyond the literal, that he was being symbolic. He was used to saying his, you know, I'll, my, actually when I die, I'll go to heaven. But when the Spirit comes, he'll bring the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. We talked about this. It's John chapter four, 14. And, um, and this is also why communion makes sense, because it's a type. It's, it's, it's a reminder of when I eat the bread and drink the cup, I am partaking of a person and what he accomplished and receiving the benefits of that accomplished or what we would call a finished work. So the gospel is about eating and drinking, partaking of Jesus who's living within us. So it's not about law. It's not about doing. It's about resting and abiding in the person that's within us. So go to 2 Peter chapter 1. He's in us. We're in him. We're joined to the Lord being one spirit. And it ha there has to be a partaking. Not a trying. Not a trying. I'm trying to do my best. Well, if you just do your best. No, we're not. We're, we, we, we die to trying. Because Christ did it all. What We're now in the person who fulfilled the law. We're in the person who's perfect. And now we're partaking of his life. And that's doing the changing. That's doing the transforming. So he set in 2 Peter chapter 1, we'll start at verse 2. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Grace and peace is multiplied through the knowledge of God. So we have to study. We have to get revelation. And the more we get, more revelation we get, the more grace is given to us not that we're earning that grace it's simply we've got all the grace there we've got all all the life of god is in us we just don't have the revelation of it so what you can't what you don't know you can't release what you don't have by way of knowledge you can't experience we have everything we just got to get a knowledge of who we are and what we have so that we can function in it verse three his divine power has granted to us all things has past tense not going to his divine power and that power is the person you can say christ has granted to us don't ever separate the power from the person the person is the power his divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through what the knowledge of him there's that knowledge again who's called us to his glory to his own glory and excellence by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them, them being these promises, you would be partakers of the divine nature. So there's that phrase, partaking of his divine nature. This is eating. This is abiding. This is resting. This is faithing. This is why the just shall live by faith. Faith in what? Faith in the person who lives within us partaking of his nature and that's doing the change so this is what partaking is now you cannot now we got promises here and the church today has has, well, has, has always been we've been brought up this way of uh, that we see a human conflict we go to the Bible to, to find an answer to that conflict and believe the promise that we found to fix the conflict, and yet not many people are getting results doing it that way. So what this scripture here is telling us is the promises are to make us partakers of his divine nature, not to give answers to fix our humanity. Everybody's going for promises to fix their humanity. Every, you just watch Christian television. They're notorious. They preach your conflict. They, you have an unsaved loved one. You're going through a divorce. You're unemployed. They, they, they look for the, con they preach the conflict that you have in life and then they go to the Bible and give you something to do or even something to believe. They can either give you a promise or they can give you law. But they're notorious for always pointing out your humanity and the conflict that you may be experiencing and then using the Bible as the answer to fix the conflict.
But the problem with that is Jesus fixed our humanity in his death. Now, I've said this a bunch of times, so let me just elaborate on that. What do you mean by he fixed our humanity? So every one of us right now, and if we don't, we will, will have conflict, trouble, something in our environment will go awry, but because we don't live in a perfect world. What does it mean that he fixed our humanity by his death? Well, let me just share this. He, did he, not, he bore the curse in Galatians chapter 3. He became a curse so that we wouldn't come under the curse of the law. Well, what are the curses of the law? Go to Deuteronomy 27 and 28, 29 through those chapters there, and you'll find out all the curses of the law. For instance, when he bore the curse, he took our sin. When he bore the curse, he took our sickness. When he bore the curse, he carried away our pain. He became poor, the Bible says, that we would have a full supply. He completely died to this world so it would not have any influence or relevance to your life or my life. So we are born again, not of the old humanity, but born again to something other than what we used to be, a new nature, a new creation, and nothing here on earth has rights to us anymore. So this is what I mean by he fixed our humanity. He took our sin, took our sickness, took our poverty, took all our pain, fixed that. That's what he did. When he took the curse upon himself. We live now in him a curseless life. So we are not to go to the Bible or promises to find answers to fix our humanity. It's already been fixed. What we need now to do with these promises is use them to do exactly what this scripture says. These promises cause me to partake of his divine nature. So I'm not looking, him, looking for him to fix anything. I'm looking him to release his nature through me into my experience on earth as it is in heaven. God doesn't want us to express our carnality on earth. He wants us to express his life, his nature, his person on earth. So that's what I mean by he fixed our humanity. So the body of Christ is trying to be human, asking God to fix our humanity. I'm going to say that again. The body of Christ is trying to be human, asking God to fix our humanity. We are not born again human. We're born again sons of God. There has been an identity change when you got born again. Otherwise, why does God use all these terminologies? New creation, born again, born of the Spirit. No one teaches. In other words, when, when, if somebody's here and they get saved, they come up here to the altar, they may say the, the sinner's prayer or whatever the tradition tells you to do to get saved. And then when they're done with that little experience, they walk away and they don't have a clue that in the spirit realm, something huge happened. They died and was born again. But they don't know that, so when they get off their knees and walk away from the altar, they feel exactly the same way they did when they walked in the church. They'll go to the same car, go to bed with the same wife, wake up with the same kids, go to the same job, and everything is exactly the same. So, again, that's living in carnality, that's living in the world, and they just added Jesus on there somewhere, and they'll try him out, and hopefully he'll stick. That's where, and most of the time, if he sticks, it's because of the, them using their willpower, but they don't have any clue that there is a huge identity change. You, when, you, when you went to the altar, you were human. When you, when you walk away from the altar, you're no longer human, you are a son of God, partaking now of his divine nature. There is deity, God now living in you, and you are one with God. You're no longer human, you're supernatural. You're not only natural, you are supernatural. He puts the super onto your natural, you could say superhuman. But the thing is, you're born again as a son and daughter of God. You are now partaking of divine nature, not your old nature. So when you walk away, if you don't have that revelation, you go right back into your old identity and live your old way and keep trying to be whatever you were trying to be before or add Jesus and try him out now and see if he works. 
And so this is the problem in the church today. We don't know that there has been a huge identity change, a shift in who we are when we got born again. So Jesus fixed our humanity and the promises are for partaking of his divine nature so that we can release his nature in, in all environments, in all situations, in all circumstances. And, part, and, and so what the whole thing is, again, on earth as it is in heaven. So religion doesn't see this. There's a disconnect in religion. And therefore, there is no relationship. There's no intimacy. We don't understand our oneness. God's up there. We're down here hoping he'll show up somewhere, somehow, some way. We are the answer to conflicts by releasing the nature. So I'm not looking to fix anything. I'm looking to the nature to be released in my environment so that God can bring his life, his purpose, his plan on earth. And I'm going to keep saying this because it's, it's the key. On earth as it is in heaven. So look at the life of Jesus. Read through the Gospels. You're going to see this. He's one with the Father. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And he says, they're not my words that I speak, and they're not my works that I do. They're the Father's words. They're the Father's works. And so Jesus did exactly what I'm trying to teach here today. He, he didn't come down here to fix conflict and say, oh, God, help me down here. He released the Father's words. He released the Father's works. And God was accomplishing his purposes on earth as they were already foreordained in heaven. So Jesus was not about fixing conflict. He was about releasing the Father's will on earth through himself. So I'm not down here trying to fix that, Lord, fix that. I'm here. I understand now who I am in Christ. I'm one with him. And so I'm looking at my life and partaking of his nature and releasing that nature. And if I do come across conflict, I have to say that has no power over me. For instance, if money's low, I don't see, I'm not trusting God for money because he's already fixed that. He's fixed the poverty problem. And the church, you know, we'll probably develop this hopefully down the road, but the church doesn't understand that money is now our servant, not something to trust God for because it's already done. And so we're not ruling and reigning as sons and daughters over money. We're, we're acting as if, oh God, money's the answer and I'm trusting you to give me that answer when he's already given us a full supply in his son. And so money now has to become a cert, something we use to get God's purposes and plans done. And he meets our needs with it. So Jesus wasn't, all, Jesus wasn't trusting God for money when they needed to, they, they multiplied bread, they multiplied food. Um, go get money out of the fish's mouth. This, this is just, this is things serving him that he has control over. So he didn't pray problems. Jesus did not pray problems. He didn't go take conflict to the Father. He was the answer to all those things. He was bringing heaven on earth. He was taking his cues from heaven, not earth. Now, we talked about this, so I want to say it again if, just to really put it in there. Here's how people pray. They pray their conflict. Rather than praying, what are you doing in heaven? We are praying to God what the devil's doing on earth or what humanity's doing on earth, and we're going to the Father with the conflict, and he never tells us to do it that way. He says, pray on earth as it is in heaven, but what we're doing, we're praying in heaven as it is on earth, and we've got it backwards. And God didn't call us to pray in that manner. So we are not, we've got everything backwards. We've perverted this whole thing. And Galatians talks about that in chapter 1. It's a perversion of the gospel. We have the front and the back and the back and the front. We're doing everything backwards. We're not walking toward victory. You know, we're walking from victory. But everybody's trying to get victory when they, rather than saying, I'm already victorious, now let's be victorious. Let's, let's, we're walking from an already won position, not trying to win something. And it's the same thing in every aspect of our life. Everything is backwards, which we've talked about that before. So let me just let me just skip some stuff here and get right into the what God has designed is a supernatural experiential dynamic of the nature of God manifesting in and out of every believer. We'll say that again. What God the gospel is God designing us to walk a supernatural experiential, dynamic life, partaking of the nature of God and manifesting that in and out of every believer and affecting every conflict environment that we are in. That nature is so supernatural by God's grace 
that we are capable of hearing and functioning, acting in the nature of Christ as we're one with the Godhead. Now, God's going to do everything. God has already done everything. What we've got to do is find out what he's already done in order to release that. Now, being one with him, the body of Christ, we are the evident presence of the witness of God. He shows up in every situation and environment. Again, study the life of Jesus and see how the Father shows up in the life of Jesus. And what's true of Jesus is a duplication or a type or an example of how you and I are supposed to live on this earth. Exactly. Jesus showed us the way to do this. So we let the... Now, now let me... Listen to this. People, most Christians, and I mean this, most Christians let the environment dictate how they feel. So in other words, if they wake up with a bunch of conflict, it makes them feel a certain way. They're down, they're depressed, they're discouraged. We're all guilty of this. And this is not how Jesus lived. He didn't let the environment dictate how he felt. We think that we are going to go through, let me say this again, we let the environment dictate how we feel. We think what we are going through is what we have to believe God for. This is, what, this is where we live. What we're going through is what we've got to believe God for. In other words, if I'm going through the lack of finances, then I've got to believe God for those finances. But what if what you're going through is where God has you to demonstrate himself in that situation and circumstance? Not to fix it with some answer. We'll try this. We'll try that. What if he says, no, what you're going through don't believe me for what you're going through is where I have you God's in control he's sovereign where I have you and the purpose of where you're at is to release my nature to release my life in that and I gave you that example when I was at Walmart last week and I'm not going to share that again but if you remember that God had me there to answer the environment to fix somebody's conflict not with a promise but with the very life of God in me being expressed through me on earth as it is in heaven. So this woman's in line. She needs money. How's God going to get money to her from heaven on earth except through you and me? He put me there in that environment to release an answer, which is his life living through me. If you're in divorce, God's there to demonstrate reconciliation. So... You have to see God has got you in every situation, circumstance to release himself. God wants people to encounter him. Not more rules and regulations or just answers. Here's a couple bucks, buddy. Oh, thanks. I appreciate that. Did he encounter God at that point? Not unless we let him know, hey, look, this is from God, not from me. If I'm unemployed, God has me there to, de to demonstrate his supply. God is all about releasing His Son, the life of His Son, through us. And you and I are the evidence of His resurrection. There's got to be a manifestation. There's got to be an answer. There's got to be a release. There's got to be, like again, on earth as it is in heaven. So the Spirit of God's life is in us. Now the flip side of that is our experience. Well, what do you mean? My experience is somebody hurt me or someone said something bad about me. But the flip side of God's nature is love, forgiveness, forbearance, long-suffering, patient. So we're not, we're not subject to the hurt. The flip side of my experience is God's nature. So here I am in life, life's happening, and I can either release God's nature or be in the flesh and release the hurt, the pain, the agony, the unforgiveness, the, the anger, the rage. All the stuff that the environment and the conflict wants to pull out of me, I can, the flip side of that is, no, I, this stuff's happening to me because God wants to release his life. He wants to release his nature in what these people are saying and doing. How else are they going to encounter God? What, if somebody says something to you and you, came, you come back with rage, how did they encounter God? We get this justification of, ah, they deserved it. You know, well, I don't blame you for yelling back at them. I don't blame you for doing, you know, vengeance is mine, say it us. How are they going to encounter God? How's God? How are you going to encounter God when you lack finances? How are you going to encounter God when you're sick? It's all happening. God has you there. Not, not the one making it happen, but he has you there. 
and he wants to be the one to release his life in it. So when someone says something to me and I respond in kindness, I respond in love and forgiveness, they are encountering the fruit of the Spirit, which is God's life, not me. And we have to get that or we're, we're perpetuating. The church is never going to get anywhere if we don't start releasing the nature of Christ that we are partaking of through his promises. Now, here's another thing. We, we, you know, and I'm just throwing all this because this, this will all come together. But the, the nature of Christ unveiled within us is the knowledge. Because he, he talks about that knowledge. The, your spirit, your spirit, my spirit, is already inscribed with the knowledge of God's will. So in other words, your spirit already knows everything. That's why Paul says, you know everything. What does he mean when he says, you know everything? He says, your spirit has inscribed upon it the complete blueprint of God for your life. So you're not asking God, well, in other words, which we've talked about this, I'm not going to the Father saying, Lord, I don't know what to do. No, I already know what to do because it's in my spirit. I now have to let the spirit release the information to what I'm going through. <clears throat> it's already imprinted in me, design, and I'm designed to hear and function out of what's already in me. So I'm not saying, God, what's going on so much as I look to the Spirit, Revelate or Ephesians 1 9 says, He has made known to us His will. Hath made known to us. That's past tense. So in my spirit is the will of God. So I'm not seeking, oh, what to do, what to do. I'm hearing what to do because it's already in me what to do. I just got to hear it. I have, I, let me put it this way your spirit is already inscribed with the knowledge of His will, it's already in printed design, and you are to hear and function out of what's already there. We're not praying for what we, we are not praying for what we ought to do. That's already, you know, that's unbelief it's starting out the gate. Lord, what to do? No, I'm praying for what he already has done and that what I already know in my spirit to do. We're not praying and looking for God to do. We're praying for what we already know has already been done. Let me say that again. See, this is all backwards. Religion is backwards from the true message of the gospel. We are not praying for what we do not know. We are not praying for what we do not know because that's unbelief. We are praying for what we already know. We are not praying looking for God to do. We are praying for what we know He has already done. God's not making this up as we go along. It's already done. We're trying to get the church to see that they can easily function in what he's already done by hearing and allowing the nature of God in us to be displayed through us. So promises, conflicts, prayer, seeking his will, all these things are done backwards in the church today. And that's why we're not getting any results. I mean, there is no way possible that we are sons and daughters of God and struggling with the rest of the world in the same manner. And I, I know people personally that are struggling in different areas from sickness, from poverty, from all these things. And they're Christians, they believe God, and yet the experience, the manifestation of God's life is absent. And sooner or later, the church is going to say, we have been preaching this message wrong. There's no way I should be living like this, acting like this, being like this. And I'm believing, I'm doing all that I know to do. And there's the problem. Religion has you trying more rather than just simply being who God created you to be in Christ and releasing that nature from within, not trying anything from without. We are in Him partaking of His divine nature. We're complete in Him. Colossians says we are complete in Him. So as Jesus walked this earth, He was the answer to whatever conflict or environment that He went through. And the Bible is clear on earth as it is in heaven. And we have to understand we are sons and daughters of God. And if we don't get that identity, we're going we're to miss it. We're not going to experience or evidence the resurrection life that's within us. Now Romans chapter 1 verse 16 says, the, the, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God unto salvation. Now just forget unto salvation and just think about what is the gospel? 
The gospel is the power of God. Already when he says power, that voids you and I of anything that we can add to the finished work. He doesn't say the gospel is a self-help unto salvation. The gospel is a new way to live your life. So try it and it'll work you know, for your salvation. No, no, it's a power, which means it's totally alien to anything you can give, do, or experience in and of yourself. It's the power of God, which means there's a divine assistance, there's a divine activity that's coming, that's coming to us as the gospel. It's the power of God. It's the person of Jesus. Now go to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And we'll develop this. I'm giving this to you in seed format right now. I want you to see this. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, and then I'm done. Because I think, again, when we use the word grace, power, spirit, Jesus, we promise, we see all these things as separate things. They're just different angles of Jesus is the promiser. So he's the promise. The Holy Spirit is Jesus. They're one. Um, grace is a power. Therefore, it's not just some theory, it's a person. Grace is a person. The Spirit is a person. The promise is a person. So all of this, the presence, the presence of God, the glory of God, that's a person. Everything, all these terminologies we use always end up being Jesus. Just another way of seeing him and, and talking about it. But look here, and, and, and Paul proves this right here in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. Now look, he says, I'm going to teach you about the grace of God. He's going to show you something about grace here. He said, for in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy... And their extreme what? Poverty. Have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. How is it that a church or a people are experiencing poverty and yet they are giving more than this Corinthian church who was filthy rich? What would cause a person who has a few pennies, give those pennies away. Now this is not about giving. This is Paul's saying, look, let me tell you what the grace of God looks like. It's a power. It's a transforming grace. It's, it, 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 when a person gets the grace of God working in them, they're no longer natural. Natural people save money. They tighten their belt when they're going through hardship. But when the grace of God shows up, they don't do the natural thing. They do what the nature of God within them is releasing them to do, which in this case, they were giving out of their poverty. Whereas the Corinthian church was hoarding their wealth. And he's trying to show you, you guys are not trusting in the person. You're not experiencing the power. And there is no transforming grace happening. You're just being carnal. He tells us that in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, you're carnal. There, you're not, there's no power. So, the, so when, it says, when Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, it's the power of God. It's the grace of God. It's the person of God. If you don't see Christianity is about a person, not rules, not trying this, trying that, it's about a person that you are partaking of who's doing all the changing you're, you're, you're just going to have a religious experience and there will be no manifestation. I'm all about on earth as it is in heaven for the last year and a half. You just look at the messages and you'll see we, we, we keep saying that term over and over again. And the only way you can get heaven on earth is through encountering the grace of God, which is the power of God. Now go to Romans chapter 5. Next book over. Or before Corinthians. Romans 5.
It talks about verse 15, the grace of God. He says, much more having the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. Verse 16, and the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. Drop down to verse 17. If because of one man's sin, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life. So forget about the gift of righteousness. We talked about that the last two weeks. When you receive this gospel, Jesus, the power of God, which is the grace of God, that's the only possible way to reign in life is through grace. Now, grace is not just some teaching. Remember, it's the power of God because we see the transforming effect that it had on the Macedonians there. It changes. It, you're, you're operating out of a supernatural level because you're no longer human. That grace is releasing the nature and very foundation of God's will and life in every environment. And the best way that I can describe this, that's all theology. Five minutes, I'm done. That's all theology. Here's the practical part. In the book by Watchman Nee, The Normal Christian Life, he talks about this clumsy servant. We've talked about this before. He said, there's this rich, this, and I'm adding to this, I'm just, so you can get it better. He said, there's a wealthy guy, has a big house, mansion, whatever, and he's got this servant. But the problem with the servant is he's clumsy. And I think Jerry Lewis played that type thing where he, every, he broke everything. He was so clumsy. Um, just breaking stuff all the time, which is, you know, that's, that's the comedy of Jerry Lewis. But this, this story is about a clumsy servant. And so whatever the master, master asks him to do, he either breaks the dishes, he breaks the mop, he cleans the window, breaks the window, I mean, overcooks the food. The guy can't do anything right. He's clumsy. But if he sits there in the chair and you don't ask him for to do anything, he's perfectly, looks like a perfectly good person. The problem is the minute you ask him to do something reveals how clumsy he is. So you got a guy like that, you're like, I don't ask him to do anything. Just sit there. You'll do fine sitting there. In fact, if you sit there and do nothing, you make my life easier. That means I can get some stuff done. Right? But the minute you ask the guy to do something, he's all over the place breaking everything. Now there's an illustration there that we can learn from is that God's not asking you and me to do anything. Because the minute he puts law on us, we sin. Because the power of sin is the law. The power of sin is you trying to do something. You become the clumsy servant. You might get two or three dishes done, but sooner or later you're going to break one. You might get four windows clean, but that fifth window, you break it. And God knows that we are not able to live that kind of a life that we don't sin. So he doesn't ask us to do anything anymore. And that's why Romans 7 says he delivers us from the law. Now let me take you to another example. We've, we've, we've done this one before here. Let's say, for instance, I want to I learn to play golf. So I get out there and I can't play. I'm like, man, I'm going to get some lessons. So I find some guy who knows how to give me lessons and I, I don't improve. My swing doesn't improve. The drive doesn't improve. Can't putt. I mean, I, I, I'm just like, man, something's wrong. Someone says, you need a professional to teach you. It's going to cost you money now. I, your friend tried to teach you. you could, so you think, that's what I need. I need a professional. Because you really want to play golf. So you hire a professional to teach you at some golf course some country club or something. And the guy looks at you and says, Man, you just ain't getting it. You don't have the natural ability. And I can't, I can't, you can't play golf like you want to. You just have to deal with that. No matter how hard you try, no matter, even if you get Tiger Woods to teach you, you ain't going to be a Tiger Woods. No matter how much you want to be one, it's not your bent. It's not your natural gift. But, Taking this to a fantasy realm, let's say you could get Tiger Woods 
to come inside of your body. And he can get in there. And so now when you pick up the club, who's picking it up? You are, but who's also inside of you picking that golf club up? Tiger Woods. So that when you go and you swing, it's you swinging, but it's really Tiger Woods in you, living his life, his talent through you to hit that ball down the drive, down the fairway. So um, can you imagine that now you can be the golfer you want to be? Exactly the golfer you want to be. As long as Tiger Woods is in there calling the shots and, and his talent, his ability is, is, is manifesting through you in the golf course. Now you'll go out there and you'll win a lot because you're manifesting the nature of Tiger Woods in you. This is the concept of Christianity. God in you, Christ in you, the hope of glory. You're going to get everything in life accomplished as long as you trust in Christ who's calling the shots and living his life through you. Now, if that guy who has Tiger Woods in him gets cocky and wants to, wants to pick up a... a, a, a uh, an iron, number nine, I don't know what they are, whatever club he picks up, and Tiger Woods says, oh, no, 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 not that one. We need, we need this club. And you get cocky and say, I know, nah, I know what I'm doing. Give me the seven iron on this one. It ain't going to work, is it? Tiger Woods is going to sit back and go, okay. Until you blow it again, you realize you ain't the golfer you think you are until you take your cues from me. You ain't never going to win a game. You're not going to look good on that golf course. And so you screw up all over the place, hitting balls in the, in, in the, in the water, hitting balls up, up against trees, lost balls in the woods, and you're like, okay, I get it. I am nothing without you. John chapter 15, verse 2. Apart from me, Jesus said, you can do nothing. So would you please abide in me? Would you please let rest in my ability, my grace, my power, my life to be lived through you because if you do that, you can live a supernatural life. You can manifest heaven on earth. You can release the nature of God, the life of God in every environment if you just rest in who you are in Him. You, you, you're not alone anymore. You're not your own. You've been bought with a price. Your identity has changed. You're a son and daughter of God now. You live that way. Not by rules, not by trying, by resting in the grace, resting in the power, resting in the person. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, show us this. This is not a religion. This is the big difference between Christianity and every other religion. It's about a person living inside of us and living his life through us. But the minute we make it a religion, our clumsiness shows up and our inability to play golf shows up and we screw our lives up. We get divorced, we, get, we file for bankruptcy, we can't do this, we can't do that because we are trying to do this apart from the life of God that's within us. Now the world, the lost, they have no excuse. They're lost. Christ ain't in them. But where is the glory of God in the church? The life of God being manifested. Where's heaven on earth being displayed? When was the last time you were a conduit for heaven on earth? Never going to happen apart from Him. Until we yield, surrender, whatever words you want to use, till we get faith to believe and trust in the life that's in us, rather than trusting in ourselves, and law, and doing, and trying, dying to all that religious crap, and finally getting in the relationship of oneness and letting him live his life through us, we're not going to manifest any kind of fruit on this earth. So Father, open our eyes to the very life that resides within us, the resident one, Christ Jesus in us, the hope of glory that we may be the answer to every conflict in every environment, manifesting the life of God on earth as it is in heaven. Open our eyes to what we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.